Hello and welcome to another very exciting See the Change USA webinar. My name is Vincent Weiss. I'm the manager of product and training development. And today we are going to jump into the first part of a four part series in which we are going to look at all of the things covered in Physics One Energy One. Um, Going into this unit, I'm just going to assume that you have seen or are familiar with some of the content that was from Newton's Laws 1. So if I bring up some things that you may not understand, some of those things, especially dealing with forces and vectors, um, I would uh, suggest that you jump and take a look at some of those, those earlier webinars looking at Newton's Laws 1. But um, starting off with some housekeeping items, First off, for this webinar, there will be no audio or video. So if you have turned on your video, if you could please shut that off, you will not need it. So we're going to communicate using the chat box feature. If you don't see the chat box on your screen, go to the top of the screen, and a drop-down menu will come down. And then go to the right where that ellipse is. Click on the ellipse, and then you shall see an option to open up the chat box. So open that up, and if you have any questions during this session, I would encourage you to type in your questions and throughout the session I will see if anyone has any questions, read any questions, address those questions and at the very end there will be a question and answer session so you can answer all your questions there as well. As always this session will be recorded and the recording of the session will be posted both on the physics lab and the See the Change USA Edmodo group so you'll be able to access the recording there. Um, in both places, you'll be able to access it under the Energy One uh, material. On the Physics Lab, it'll be on the Teacher Content Training material. And on the Edmodo group, it will be in the folders under uh, Energy One. And the PowerPoint will be made available on the See the Change USA Edmodo group. So if you are not a member of that group, I will tell you at the very end how you can become a member, and then you can access the PowerPoint. So the purpose, first and foremost, for all these is to build your confidence in physics. So you are all wonderful science teachers. Our aim and goal and purpose is to make you all world-class middle school physics teachers. We want you to know this content like no other teachers know it. And this way you will be able to teach it like no other teachers can teach it. So first and foremost, we want you to be absolutely confident in the physics. And we also want you to enjoy it because physics is such a beautiful science and there's so many wonderful things that um, we usually don't see until someone lights a lamp and shows us and I guess teaches us uh, some of the rules of, of how nature is because that's really what physics is. Physics is the rules of nature and if we are tuned into those rules then we will see it everywhere we go and that will bleed across in the classroom as well. And also this is to help you bring high-level physics content to the middle school mind. Some of the concepts in physics, I wouldn't say so much are difficult, but they are new. And it's always difficult to learn something brand new. So um, really we want to teach you some tips, tricks, and some, some, some ways to bring some of these physics concepts to a brand new middle school mind. So who is this for? It's for teachers looking to take their students to a deeper level of understanding. It's also for teachers who do not have an extensive background in physics but would like to master the concepts. If you're brand new to physics, do not worry. We're going to break this down step by step, starting with definitions and then building up from there. And this is also for teachers looking for alternate ways to explain concepts to your students. So some of the explanations are things that we have wrestled with to try to break them down as, as much to this middle school level as, as, as we can. So hopefully there are some things that you can take away and actually use in the classroom. So what we will cover, we'll cover the content found in lessons 1.4.1 through 1.4.6. So the first six lessons of Energy One. And within those lessons, we establish a foundation for the concepts of work, which is pivotal for the concept of energy. And we discuss how machines can help us accomplish work. And we'll go through all the 
six simple machines and talk about mechanical advantage. And then we'll explain what power is and how it can be calculated. Um, so when we hear how much power consumption, we'll immediately know what, what physics has to say about power. And then finally at the end, there will be a question and answer session about the content found in these first six lessons in the unit energy one, unit 1.4. All right, so without any further ado, let us begin. So energy one, starting with work and simple machines. So imagine this little guy is tasked with pushing this couch across the room a specific distance. This will take a certain amount of effort. But if we enlarge that room and make the space that he has to push that couch farther, then it's easy to see that it will take more effort to push it that extra distance. But what's interesting is that the amount of force this guy has to come up with doesn't change. So it's the same force whether he's pushing it a small distance or a long distance. But the longer distance requires more effort. So force doesn't give us a way to really describe how much effort it takes to move something. So what would be really nice if we had a way to describe how much effort is involved in either moving something against the force or accelerating it. And as it turns out, we do. And that something is called work. So work describes the effort that is involved in either speeding something up or moving something against a force. In the example we just looked at, um, the work involved required the describe the effort involved in moving that couch against the force of friction. The farther he had to move that couch, the more effort it would have taken because friction would have been acting on him the entire time. So what is work? So work is something that's done by a force, and it's defined as the product between the force that is applied multiplied by the displacement that that force actually moves an object. So when we say displacement, we mean displacement in the direction of the force. We will look at some examples where an object may be applying a force on an object, but it doesn't cause that object to move in the same direction as the force. But work is the product of force and displacement or distance. And um, we'll take a look at many examples along the way, but let's kind of take a look at the units of force or units of work. If we want to know the units of work, we need to know the units of force and displacement. Well, from Newton's laws one, we saw that the units of force is kilogram meter per second squared, and the unit of displacement is the same as distance, is a meter. So if we take these two units and multiply them together, then we get this kilogram meter squared per second squared. So this is a mouthful. It is the fingerprint of work. And whenever we see that crazy unit, we know we're talking about the amount of effort or the work involved in doing something. But when units get this kind of crazy, we like to give them a different name. So we're going to call whatever this unit is, we're going to call it a joule. So a joule is the standard unit for work. And just because something is a standard unit doesn't necessarily mean that it is the only unit. For example, a meter is the standard metric unit for distance, but a foot is also a unit of distance. So when we look at this joule, one of probably the most common units of work that we're familiar with on a day-to-day -day basis is actually the dietary calorie. So calories can describe how much energy is in food, but if you've ever been to a gym and have tried one of these fitness equipments like the treadmill or the elliptical machine, most of those machines have a built-in calorie counter, which um, tells you how much calories you have burned or another interpretation, how much effort you have put in to your exercise. And as it turns out, that little calorie counter uses this very same equation, force times distance, to approximate how many calories one burns as they're on that machine. It 
figures out how much force, it estimates how much force um, using your weight would you have to apply over the amount of distance that you run. And using that, it can figure out how many calories you burn or how much effort you spend working out. So even though the jewel may be unfamiliar, we're constantly surrounded with units of energy because we're always, or units of work, because we're always um, seeing this unit of calorie, which there's a conversion factor that to go from calories to joules, and it all describes the same thing. Okay? So now work is done by a force whenever an object moves, specifically in the direction of the applied force. So let's take a look at some examples. So here's a baseball bat. If the baseball bat swings and makes contact with that baseball, the applied force is this direction. And we know immediately after the bat hits the ball, the ball will be moving in the same direction. So whenever the force is applied and it causes an object to move in the same direction, we say that work is done. And in fact, work is done. So let's take a look at another example. Here's this basketball suspended above the earth. And we see that the earth pulls the basketball down. And if the basketball is not moving, it will go straight down as well. So work is done. In fact, work is done. So any object that falls towards the ground, uh, we say that the earth accomplishes work on that object. So the work is done by the earth. And that's what actually um, uh, it pulls the ball down. A force of Earth pulling the ball down. So let's take a look at a different example. Let's take a look at this moon. So the moon orbits the Earth. Now, if we were to look, we would see that the Earth pulls the moon towards the Earth. But the moon is in motion, so it ends up moving in a completely different direction from which it is pulled. So whenever this happens, we say that no work is done. In fact, the Earth does absolutely no work on the moon, even though it is the force of gravity that causes the moon to orbit. But because the Earth doesn't manage to pull the moon closer in, it doesn't actually do any work on the moon. And that enables it to continue to move around the Earth forever. Now, there are some situations, like let's say we have a star, and it feels the gravitational pull of a really large black hole. So it gets, so it's being pulled towards the black hole. But it doesn't seem as though that it's going to move in the direction. Let's say the star is moving, and it gets pulled towards the black hole. But since it's in motion, it doesn't go straight towards the black hole. And now it doesn't seem any work is done. But so long as the black hole pulls the star in in some kind of spiral fashion, just like that, then we can say the star moves close to the black hole with every turn and work is done. So it may not be done as fast as being pulled straight towards the black hole, but over time it gets closer and closer to the black hole until eventually it gobbles it up, gobbles it up and uh, there's, there's no more work to be done. So work is done in this situation. All right, now work is done during the time a force is actually applied. Um, I, I need to stress this because it is common misconception for students to look at a situation and say work is being done when it's not. So let's take a look at an example. Here is the baseball bat, and it comes in contact with the ball. Now, while the bat is physically touching the ball, the bat is doing work on the ball. So work is done here. But in a very short moment later, it's no longer touching the ball, and no work is done here. So all the work the bat accomplishes, it accomplishes during that small period of time it's in physical contact with the ball. So if we wanted to know how much work this baseball bat was doing on the ball and we wanted to use the expression 
work is equal to force times distance or displacement, kind of the same thing. Then we would need to ask for what distance was the bat physically touching the ball because that is the distance we're interested in. It's actually not the distance the ball goes and this is the misconception most students have. They would say if the bat does work on the ball we need to figure out how far the ball goes. But um, you can imagine if you were in space you can throw a ball and because of Newton's first law that ball would continue traveling until it crashes off to some star or dust field or whatever several light years away. So just because you can throw something arbitrarily far in space doesn't necessarily mean it requires more effort to throw it that far. Remember work is effort so all the effort of throwing a ball happens while that ball is being accelerated. In this case with the baseball bat all the effort of all the, the work of the baseball bat goes into the effort of accelerating the ball during the brief period of time it's in physical contact with the bat. All right, so that about sums up what I want to talk about as far as work goes. Let's take a look at something that we can do with work. So now we're going to talk about machines. So first, and foremost, a machine is simply a device that can help someone accomplish work. So to break this down, just about any machine can be broken down into a bunch of machines. We call the six simple machines. So those are the lever, the wedge, the ramp, the screw, the wheel and axle, and finally the pulley. So notice all of these things are used to help someone accomplish work. The levers helping this man lift this big heavy cube. The wedge can be used to split a tree apart. Imagine trying to take a tree and just a tree stump and pulling it apart with your bare hands. That would be quite a task. But um, using an ax, you can accomplish the same task um, it may not be one quick go. It may be a few swings, but eventually you'll get through that piece of wood. The ramp is helping this person push the sled up. The screw, using all these turns of the screw, you can lift a car. This wheel and axle, um, the door knob helps someone turn that little axle inside the door so you can actually open the door. Um, if you've ever tried to take the door knob off and see that little square thing and trying to turn that with your bare hands is very difficult. So having the door knob makes it so you can actually rotate that little piece. And finally the pulley. So let's kind of take a look. Machine will use work to do one of two things. It will either trade distance for force or force for distance. So let's take a look at how a machine actually accomplishes this. So here is a pulley. And we see that there's a hand pulling this string. So some force would be applied here by the hand. But since the string is connected to the pulley, the tension in that string gets transferred also to this side. So we have another force this way. So notice it's like by using this pulley, it's like he gains another hand to help him pull this bucket up. So by using that simple, one simple pulley, it's as if this person is able to double their force to help them lift the bucket. Now it would seem as though this person managed to gain something for nothing. But if we were to zoom out a little bit and analyze the situation a little closer, we would see a little different situation. So now let's take a look at how far both of these things move. So as this bucket gets pulled up, the hand moves this distance and the bucket moves this distance. If we compare these two distances, then all of a sudden everything starts to make sense. By doubling the force, we decrease the amount of distance that bucket moves. 
And this is how every machine works. You can increase the amount of force by sacrificing distance. So in the case of this pulley, doubling the force comes at the cost of decreasing the distance the bucket moves. So he has to, this, this hand has to pull twice as, as long to get double the force. So if this is just a machine, every machine works on one principle. The amount of work that goes in the machine will equal the amount of work that comes out of the machine. And if we remember, work is equal to force times distance. This means the product of force and distance that goes into the machine must equal the force and distance that comes out. But if the force gets big, that means the distance must get small. And this is what a machine does. It makes one big and the other small. So, just to reiterate, the work that goes into a machine, and when I say the work that goes into a machine, I, I mean the amount of work that a user must physically put into the machine. So, in the example of the pulley, we would look at the work that the hand accomplishes by pulling that string or the rope up. And this must equal the amount of work that comes out of the machine. So, this, if we look, if we consider again that pulley, is the work that the actual, um, the work that you get out of it, lifting up that bucket. So we can calculate the amount of work it takes just to, to lift up the bucket. So work is equal to force times distance. So this means the work in is equal to the amount of force that goes into the machine times the distance that goes into the machine. And this is equal to the work that comes out or the force that comes out of the machine times the distance that comes out of the machine. So if we just kind of rearrange some of these variables by moving them to other sides, we can potentially come up with this expression. So now imagine you want to design a machine to lift something that is five times heavier than you can actually physically lift. This means you need a machine that is able to produce an output force five times greater than what you're able to put in. So if that were the case, then this whole ratio would equal five. So if this side equals five, then this side must also equal five. And the only way that can happen is if the input distance or the distance you apply a force is five times greater than the distance that comes out. So if we looked at our pulley example, you would have to design a machine where you'd have to pull that string five times longer than you actually move the bucket up. And that would give you a force that's five times as great. So we can see that using this these relationships, we can design a machine that works to our advantage. So these relationships or these ratios are called the mechanical advantage of a machine. So a machine can have a mechanical advantage and can actually give some sort of advantage in two different ways. It can either provide some advantage in force by increasing the amount of force a user can muster up, or it can provide an advantage in distance. Unfortunately, it cannot provide an advantage in both. An advantage in one gives a disadvantage in the other. And uh, as of yet, no machine has been found or invented or created that can simultaneously give an advantage in both. But I would say that if such a machine can be proposed, then um, well, it would change the world as we know it. And some things that once could be physically impossible would be possible. Um, and it would also turn physics upside down on its head. So uh, it's one of the fundamental laws of physics that makes it this way. But um, how neat would it be if there was a machine that can give an advantage in both? But unfortunately, an advantage in one gives a disadvantage in another. So let's see how 
mechanical advantage works. So imagine you have this piano and you need to lift it up this ledge from here to here. Now to just lift the piano with brute strength uh, would I'll take quite a bit of force and most people cannot produce that much force by themselves, but we can use a machine. So imagine we wheel in a ramp and put that piano on wheels and then just we could push the piano right up the ramp. And this ramp provides a mechanical advantage. So let us see how we can calculate the mechanical advantage of this ramp. So the actual distance of the ramp is the distance that we must put into the machine because the ramp is the machine and what we got out of it was the distance that we really wanted to move the piano to begin with this this height uh, we didn't need to move it this far we could have just brute force lifted it because this is really what we wanted to get out of it and that's what we put into it so the mechanical advantage is given to the distance that goes in or this distance divided by the distance that you wanted out, or this distance. So if we were to give numbers to these, so I would say the distance in is five feet, and say it lifted it up three feet, and plug that into our equation for a mechanical advantage, then we would end up with this number 1.7. And notice it wouldn't have any units because the feet cancel out. So this is just a pure number. So now the question is, what in the world does this 1.7 mean? We know this is the mechanical advantage, but what does that mean? Well, this number describes how much the machine multiplies the force. So by using this simple ramp and pushing the piano up the ramp, um, this guy was able to lift 1.7 times more than he would be able to without using the ramp. So this is exactly what mechanical advantage describes. So some machines will take a force and a distance and it would spit out a larger force and a smaller distance. Whenever a machine increases the force by decreasing the output distance, then we say it has a mechanical advantage greater than one. So here is one example. Here we have this lever, and it increases the man's force. And the reason we know that is we can compare the distance he must pull down compared to the distance that this big heavy cube lifts up. So if he pushes that thing down, notice how he has to move a much farther distance than actually comes out of the machine. If we... By just eyeballing it, this distance looks somewhere in the vicinity of 8 to 10 times greater than this distance. So by comparing these distances, uh, we see that this definitely has a mechanical advantage greater than 1. And I would say this distance is probably somewhere 8 to 10 times greater than this distance, which means by using this lever, this man is able to exert a force somewhere between eight to 10 times more than he could actually lift up. And not only that, he gets to push down, so he gets to use his weight. So there's an extra advantage that's not even involved in the actual machine itself. So as you can see, if you just get a really, really, really long lever, you can come up with really huge mechanical advantages. Now, Archimedes, said, if you give me a fulcrum point, so some point, and a long enough lever, I could move the whole earth. Well, granted, I couldn't move it very far, but the principle is still there. If you have a long lever and a fulcrum point, so long as you just increase that distance enough, then you can come up with a really huge force to where he said you can lift the whole world. Um, so, pretty neat. Now, there are other type of machines that take a force and distance input, and after they go in, they give you a large distance but a small force. Whenever this happens, the machine has a mechanical advantage less than one. So one of the examples I like to use is think of a pair of tongs. If you've ever used a pair of tongs, 
or um, a pair of chopsticks, you would immediately notice that your gripping power is greatly diminished. Um, tongs don't allow you to grip things stronger than just picking something up. But what they do provide is distance. So this way you can pick some food up without getting you know, germy, grubby hands all into some food that everyone's going to eat. Or you can flip some steaks that are on a fire safely by keeping your distance. So the advantage of using such a machine as tongs is that you can have a large distance, but it comes at the cost of de decreasing the force or really the gripping strength. Here's another example, the bicycle. So if we were to just take a look at the distance this foot travels in one complete circle and compare that with the output distance that the machine gives, we have these two circles. And after one complete revolution, we will immediately notice that the bigger circle travels this distance while the smaller circle travels this distance. So we see immediately a bicycle gives us an increased distance and consequently gives us increased speed. So this is really um, a good example of the mechanical advantage of an object or the advantage you get from an object that has a mechanical advantage less than one. But it does come at the cost of a decreased force. So if you had to choose which one of these circling objects you would want to slow down, the rotating foot or the rotating wheel, you always want to try to slow down the rotating wheel uh, because even though it may be moving faster, it's rotating with less rotational force. So that about sums up all I wanted to talk about for machines and mechanical advantage and work. So let us take a look at one more concept it's in the last couple of lessons of these first six lessons. We're going to look at power. Power describes how quickly a force accomplishes work. So imagine you want to go on a either a two-mile run or a two-mile walk. And the question is, which one will burn more calories? So to answer this question, I guess I could, um, I'm going to have to make a few simplifications. And I'm just going to look at um, the amount of work that's accomplished. Because if we look at effort, or if we look at calories, or we look at work, then it simply comes down to force and distance. There's no time involved. So one can say that whether you run two miles or walk two miles, you will burn approximately the same amount of calories. So what really is the difference? The difference is if you were to run two miles, you would demonstrate more power. So you will simply burn those calories faster. So if you are running short on time, it's, it's best to run. But if you have all day long, why not take it easy and go for a nice stroll or walk? So here is another example. Imagine you have two trucks that are the exact same mass. One zooms up to the top and the other just kind of measly makes its way up to the top. You can say the one that zooms up there is the more powerful one because it was able to accomplish the same amount of work but faster. So this is power. Now, take a look at how one could calculate power. Power is equal to the amount of work an object accomplishes divided by the amount of time. Looking at the units, we know that work gives us joules and time gives us seconds. And if we remember, a joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. Dividing that by seconds gives us a kilogram meter squared per second cubed. And right away, this is kind of a crazy unit. So gets simplified to this, but it actually gets simplified even further. So a joule per second, or a kilogram meter squared per second cubed, is the same thing as a watt. And hopefully we're all familiar with what a watt is because 
this is actually a power uh, unit that that we see. Light bulbs are given in wattages. So if you have a 60 watt light bulb and compare it to a 120 watt light bulb, what this means is that more electrons are being pushed through the 120 watt light bulb at a faster rate. So after being on for a minute, one accomplishes more work and consequently has more power. And somehow the brightness of the bulb is directly related to how quickly work is done or how quickly charge is pushed through this metal filament in the wire and equals some sort of brightness. So now concerning power, because there is an activity, I think in lesson six, um, in lesson six, students are asked to calculate the power of the human body. Um, here we have this staircase. And we're interested in asking, what is the power of a person if they were to move up the steps? How could we calculate the power of the human body? So to calculate the power of this guy, we would use the power equation, which is, is equal to the amount of work he accomplishes divided by the amount of time. Now it's easy to find the time using a stopwatch. We can have a student start off at the bottom of the steps, start the stopwatch, have them run up and then stop it and that'll give us our time. The difficult part is the work. How do we calculate how much work it takes for a student to run up a set of stairs? The reason this is difficult is because if you were to look at this staircase, what does it look like? It's actually a simple machine. It's a version of an inclined plane or a ramp. So by using a set of stairs, we decrease the amount of force it takes to move up the stairs. And this is a good thing because most of us don't, cannot apply enough force to simply jump up to the next level, but we need some sort of simple machine to help us get up there. And as it turns out, I mean, every time we use stairs, we are taking a ramp. But what is the force it takes to actually move up it? Because if we know the force, and if we can measure this distance, then we can figure out work. Um, the difficulty is, is finding out how much force it takes to move a person up those stairs. Um, it's a problem that we've not talked about, and students will not probably be able to do to high school because it requires a certain knowledge of trigonometry. But as it turns out, there is another way we can figure this out using some principle that we've stated previously. With any machine, the amount of work that goes in the machine is equal to the work that comes out of the machine. So if there's a way that we can calculate work without worrying about the force that goes up, then maybe we should use that method. So let's take a look at some examples. So here's this piano. And as I said before, there are two ways there's many ways we can get this piano up, but we could take a look at two different ways we can lift this piano up. We can lift it straight up and over, or we can move in a ramp and slide the piano up the ramp. And what I want to stress is whatever way we use, both situations require the same amount of work. So whether we slide it up or lift it up and over, the work is the same. So we can figure out how much work it takes to slide up the ramp by figuring out how much work it takes to simply lift the piano up. So if we have an option to choose between one way or the other way, it's always best to go with the easiest route. And as it turns out, to figure out how much work it takes to lift the piano up and over is much, much easier. Um, because as it turns out, if you lift the piano straight up, all the work is done here. Not a whole lot of work is, is done moving it over. Because remember, work describes how much effort is involved in moving something against the force. In this case, it is the force of gravity. So how do we figure out how much work is required to lift the piano straight up? Well, this would depend on the amount of force it takes to lift the piano multiplied by the distance it is lifted. So the force to lift the piano is given by its weight 
because weight is a force and we need to overcome that force to lift it up. And if you remember from Newton's laws one, weight is given by the product of its mass times the acceleration due to gravity. So before one actually calculated this, we would have to put this piano on a scale to measure its mass. So knowing its mass and knowing the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second squared, and the distance that it moves is the total height. So we could say the work just to lift the piano up is equal to mgh. And this is the exact same amount of work that it would take to slide the piano up. So when we come to this situation of someone running up a set of stairs, we simply need to know how much work would it take to lift the person up to the next level. So we can use that exact same expression, work is equal to the mass of the person times the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8, multiplied by the height. So one way we can find the height is to measure the height of each one of these steps and add them all together. Or we can measure the height of one step, assume all of them are the same, and then multiply by the number of steps. Or um, there's probably more than those ways to do it, but that's what we would need to do. So one of our students, uh, no, one of our, one of our teachers going through this very similar type of activity uh, ran into the problem that they didn't have scales to actually measure their mass. Um, there are scales out there that you can stand on and will measure your, your mass in kilograms. Um, but uh, if you don't have one of those scales, you can use a scale that measures your mass in pounds and then convert to kilograms. Very simple. But most students, you can assume, know approximately how much they weigh. So, so long as a student has a rough idea how much they weigh, then you don't need a scale at all. So if you don't have a scale, it doesn't matter. Just have the students put in what they think they weigh. And most often than not, that's going to be pounds. They will know how much they weigh in pounds. And we need that mass in kilograms in order to plug it in here. So to convert from pounds to kilograms is a simple process. So what I'm going to do now is open up a share screen and just kind of take you through what I would do, but I'm not finding me. So I have right here, a quick Google search, pounds to kilograms brings up a quick conversion factor. We see that one pound is equal to 0 0.453592 kilograms. Um, for the sake of this activity, all of these digits are not super necessary because we're not dealing with very precise numbers. So we can round this to 0 0.5 to make things simple for students. So this means one pound is equal to roughly half a kilogram. So this gives us a really easy way to quickly convert from pounds to kilograms. We either multiply by 0 0.5 or we can divide by two. So if a student weighs about 100 pounds, divide that number by two, we can say they weigh about 50 kilograms, and that gives their mass. So now let me go back into this screen. So if a student knows their weight, have them divide their weight by two to get roughly what their mass is, multiply that by 9.8 meters per second squared, and then multiply that by the height of all the steps, and they can get a rough estimation about how much work it takes for them to go up that set of stairs. Next, we divide it by the amount of time it takes them to get up those stairs, and that gives us the power of their body. So what's neat about this is to compare the power of the human body to the power of a common light bulb, say 60 watt or 120 watt, and 
to find out can a body produce more power than a light bulb? Um, and how bright of a light bulb can they compete with? And believe it or not, this is not so strange. There are actually companies that are designing fitness equipment that converts mechanical energy from the human body and converts it into electrical energy so that third world countries that do not have a large power plant or a large power creating facility to move out to a grid can install some type of equipment and do some exercise and cause the lights to turn on. Or this is a way for someone to save a little bit of money on their light bill in the United States and burn some calories while they're, they're at it. So it's, it's really a win-win situation. But when designing these things, these people have to look at these very same equations we've been looking at. They have to look at force, work is equal force times distance, and they have to look at the power equation. Power is equal work divided by time. And these are the equations that they have to work with to see if these ideas are even viable because it would be an awful lot of money to throw into something just to see if it works. But through some very quick calculations, a student could even figure out, is this idea even a viable option? So this about wraps up all the material that is found within the first six lessons of this unit. So now I want to open it up to any questions. So now I just want to take time to answer any questions that anyone has. So if you have any questions, do feel free to type them into the chat box and we will discuss them. All right, doesn't seem as though there are any questions. Um, if you think of something else, you can always email me and I'll give you my email at the end, but it um, doesn't look like anyone has any questions. So next time we are going to dive into the second part of Energy One. We're gonna look at energy and potential energy. Look at those two things. This will be on January 21st. 2016, this is a typo, not 15, 2016, and we will start again um, at 4.30 Mountain Standard Time. So, and as always, you can access the recording of this webinar either on the Physics Lab or on the See the Change USA Edmodo Group, and the PowerPoint will be on the See the Change Edmodo Group, and if you would like to, if you're not a member of the See the Change USA Edmodo group but would like access to, uh, do feel free to send me an email and I'll give you my email. Uh, but teacher content, for more teacher content training support, do check out our physics lab. We're trying to throw up more stuff just about every week. And you can find teacher content training that come in videos. There's other webinars and there's other goodies uh, found within the units under teacher content training tab. So I do encourage you to check those out. Um, also, if you join the See the Change USA Edmodo group, you will have access to not only everyone on our team, but you'll have access to all the teachers working through these units that are members themselves. So it's a really great place to collaborate, to share ideas, and to gain new interesting perspectives on teaching and education. So here is my email. So if you would like to email me about teacher content training, you could schedule a personal one-on-one -on -one session with me and we can work through very specific things. Or you can get a hold of Laura, whom you all know, and here's her email address. And finally, last but not least, if you just have a quick question and 
you just want to talk to us directly, then do feel free to give us a call at one 843 All right, if there are no other questions, then I just want to thank you all so much for joining us, and hopefully you found a few things that you, you can use in the class. And we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you so much.